All right, so welcome everyone to the Schuber seminar. Uh, today we're, we're very happy to have uh, Liz Milicevic from Harborford uh, telling us about crystal shoot moves on pipe dreams. Uh, so please take it away, uh, Liz. Thanks. Um, thanks to the organizers so much for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm a regular attendee of this seminar and have, if I find it to be one of the few uh, lovely things that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm happy that it's still going. So I'm uh, glad to be able to uh, make a, my own small contribution uh, to what is a rich um, and lively seminar. So when I get to new results in the second half, um, everything I say there will be joint work with uh, Sarah Gold and Yu Shuan Sung, who were Haverford graduates of class of 2020, uh, whatever, this past spring, 2023. Um, so just recently graduated. All right. Um, so I will start with a very, uh, what I hope is a friendly and uh, somewhat helpful introduction to crystals. So I think that that is not necessarily a common piece of background for everyone who regularly attends this seminar. So that's the perspective that I'm adopting. So I'll first start with a brief and extremely incomplete history of uh, crystals focusing on kind of the origins and the kind of work that was happening around the beginnings of the formalization of the notion of, of a crystal, but crystals in broad strokes are combinatorial structures, which in, are um, defined to encode representations of Lie groups and Lie algebras um, in particular. And so work starting around the 1990s um, was happening, I would say, Strong origins are due to Kashiwara, who was working on representations of quantum groups um, really around 1990. And then at the same time, um, but independently, Lustig was doing work on his canonical bases, which turned out to be uh, related to crystals. Um, a bit around the same time, maybe a bit earlier, um, work of Drinfeld and, and separately work of Jimbo, on, quant on quantized enveloping algebras um, was, was coming out and was not being framed in the language of crystals, but was again, sort of underpinning the origins um, of that theory. And then by the time we get to the mid nineties, um, people like Littleman were um, using path models to formalize um, standard monomial theory in the likes of Lakshmi Bayan Sashadri um, and putting crystal structures on um, paths in, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a picture later. So I'll maybe say a little bit more about what I mean um, about that model later. Um, and then just to get the word uh, Demazur in. So thinking about building modules um, via line bottles on flag varieties. Um, this is the perspective of um, folks like Demazur and uh, that representation theory is also um, encoded in a similar way um, through the language of crystals. Um, if you've seen <laughs> the definition of a crystal, then uh, perhaps your impression is much like your impression of this slide, is that there's, okay, there's a set that satisfies a bunch of axioms. <laughs> um, I will give an example, which is very concrete, where I try to sort of um, highlight the flavor of, this typical flavor of, um, each of the pieces or the components of a crystal, but at the bottom, at the sort of at the heart, you have a set. Um, that set comes equipped with some kind of weight function, and I will make that concrete. So each, um, each element in this set is typically re re represented as a vertex in a graph, and you can evaluate um, a weight function on those vertices which will spit out a vector, an integer valued vector. And um, the real heart of crystal uh, theory is a pair of operators, um, EI and FI. EI are usually um, uh, the um, raising operators and FI the lowering, but um, they are mutually inverse. Um, and so they kind of come as a pair. And 
um, the, these operators have a predictable action on the weights. So if you, if you calculate the weight of a vertex um, and then you raise, then this will add a bit of weight and it adds the vector alpha i where alpha i here is um, the difference of the two standard basis vectors ei uh, and e i plus one. Okay, so that definition uh, doesn't necessarily help you hang any meat on the bones of it. So let me give you an example, an example that uses some of the combinatorics that many of us use in uh, Schubert, various aspects of Schubert theory. So fix a partition lambda. So a partition um, will have here for this context, um, n minus one many parts. By the way, that n minus one matches the, um, I didn't say it explicitly, but I wrote it that um, I'm talking here about type a n minus one crystals or a n minus one crystal structures. There are crystals in all the various Lie types, but I'll focus on type A in this talk. Um, so, okay, so we have a partition and it has a, has a specified number of parts. Um, so here's an example of a vertex set for a crystal. So semi-standard Young tableau of shape given by lambda. And we're filling, um, are filling those, those semi-standard Young tableau with the alphabet one up to N and N is linked to the length of that partition. So here's an example. If lambda is three, two, one, so I've represented um, that lambda in a Young diagram as the number of uh, boxes goes, well, uh, yeah, I guess I'm using um, English style. So three boxes, then two boxes, then one box going down. And this filling um, is such that I have to strictly increase in columns, but I weakly um, increase across rows. So there's an example of a filling um, provided. Okay, so, so semi-standard Young tableau of a fixed shape um, with a specified alphabet are vertices of a crystal. Okay, so now let me build the other aspects of the crystal for you. Um, so we need a weight function. And in this example, the weight function just counts um, how many of each letter in the alphabet do you have. And so in this example here, um, this semi-standard Young tableau, the way that I filled it, I used two ones and I used two twos, and then I used one each of um, three and four. So that's the weight function in this case. All right, now the most complicated thing is to get your operators uh, defined. And this usually comes in kind of a three-step process. So I'm sort of breaking down the definition of a lowering operator for you here in three parts. So one, I'll get grab a reading word corresponding to a tableau. Second, I'll do some kind of pairing process. And third, I'll give a rule, which um, allows me to switch one I to an I plus one and leaving all else the same. So, so uh, still picking on the same example. Um, my reading word, I'm gonna read up columns, uh, sorry, up, yeah, up rows, there we go. And I'm gonna read left to right within columns. Oh, sorry, gosh, up rows. I'll read rows going up and within a row, I'll read left to right, there we go. So um, so I would get four and then two, three, and then one, one, two, creating the following reading word, okay. Um, operators are defined for every single I between one and N minus one inclusive. Um, so you have to fix an I, and then I can tell you what the operator is. So in this example, I will fix I minus, I equals one because whatever. So um, for every I, I will convert the reading word, an I will be converted to this kind of parenthesis and an I plus one will be converted to this kind of parenthesis. So once I do that conversion, the four and the three, they stay untouched, but the um, two, the twos here and here have become these parentheses and the ones here and here have become these parentheses. Okay. Um, okay. And, um, and so then we look at those parentheses and we look at which ones have been paired and which ones are left unpaired. So I've drawn in this example, it's sort of clearer by inspection that these two pair off together. 
um, and that these other two are just hanging out unmatched. And the rule is that um, the rightmost unmatched one of these parentheses, so close parentheses, so that would be this one here, the rightmost unmatched one of those closed parentheses, will, um, will switch. So this one becomes that one, and I've left everything else in the reading word the same. And then I just read back the new reading word at the end. So all that, quote unquote, all that's happened in the end is that I had a one here, which became a two here. Okay. Is that okay? Um, I think that the first time I saw this definition, I heard it from Anna Schilling. She did probably a similar example and I felt like I could not absorb it. If that's also happening to you, <laughs> I empathize. But um, yeah, I want to advocate for crystals also in the context of Schubert theory um, today. So if this example doesn't do that advocacy, hopefully something later will. We'll find out. Okay, so I just want to finally note to sum up this particular example, um, the weight change or the effect on the weights given that particular lowering operator that I just did. Um, so let's uh, record, this is the pre, uh, the pre F1 and the post F1 semi-standard Young tableau. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of things to believe here. Well, if my goodness, you get a semi-standard Young tableau back in the end, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of things to check. I'm just claiming they all work. Um, and so let's see, where's this, this one has become that two. And if I pull out the new weight, I have changed a single one. Um, yeah, I have changed a single one to a two. And so whereas I had two, two, one, one before, I now have one, three, one, one before as a weight vector, which is exactly um, the required difference. Take what you had before and subtract off a difference of alpha one. Okay, so uh, I'm just saying that this, this equation holds in this example. Okay, if you do that exact thing um, to this fixed partition with an alphabet of one, two, and three, then you get exactly these eight semi-standard Young tableau. Okay, so this example is the exact same crystal structure that I just gave you. It's just on a smaller partition so that we could actually easily draw out and write down all the semi-standard Young tableau and their relationships. So I've drawn this here such that um, ones, like using lowering or raising uh, one operators are all happening kind of in the same direction of flow and same with twos in the other direction. Um, but in, a, in any case, I get eight semi-standard drug tableau altogether. And perhaps it's less <laughs> mysterious um, to observe that if you record the weights of all of those eight semi-standard unit tableau. Um, so for example, here, and you just um, make monomials with those corresponding exponent vectors um, as the weight vectors, and you record what you have for all of these eight semi-standard unit tableau, you actually build um, the Schur polynomial for that shape, lambda two comma one. So sugar polynomials, oh, sorry. So, there was there? How can it be that there are two lines from the ones in, in the middle, the lines away from them have the same color? Or could you not apply the one? Yeah. One to those in the middle, those that have twos going from them? I couldn't actually. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so oh, the, the one way would to turn see into a that, two. Yeah, I guess that's, that's yeah. not good. Okay. So the way to see that I couldn't apply, what whichever one you were just asking about would be in this like pairing process, um, to see that oops everything was paired and no I couldn't I don't have a remaining unmatched uh, parenthesis of the kind that that I would be flipping. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, I'm not claiming that it's obvious even in this small example how to work things out. Um, but yes, technically this one, this one, and this one are actually distinct. They're not like, they're not touching these. 
uh, these ones. Uh, there's, yeah. I, I draw them in this way um, because, well, you'll see in a second why I like to draw them this way. Um, but, but I do, I do get that, that one in the middle twice. I get the weight. They're two different semi-standard young tableau. Um, the two and two, twos and the threes are in different places, but, um, but the weight vector is the same in each case, one, one, one. And so I do get two copies um, of that guy in the middle. So I, they're kind of sitting on the same node, but, but they're not connected uh, in the graph in the same way. So, yeah. Um, and just to like remind ourselves, although we love sure polynomials in this seminar because of how, you know, they represent homology classes in the Grassmannian. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're doing Schubert calculus, that's probably why you like them. Um, they are characters as well. And, and that thus, you know, that's the way that sure polynomials are arising here in the context of crystals is that they're characters of irreducible representations of GLN. Okay. So I, I have more stupid questions. Oh, I thought okay. the E's and the F were supposed to be inverse to each it, other. So how, how does that work in the middle? It, well, uh, I can only, so say from here to here, I could apply um, an F1 to get that way, or I could apply an E1 to uh, get that way. I see. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm abbreviating on the vert uh, sorry, on the edges. I'm abbreviating uh just with the subscript i because uh the e the ei and the fi are, are uh, mutually inverse. So if you can apply one, you can always apply the other. Yeah. So yeah, it's enough thanks. to decorate it with i. Great. Great. Okay, uh just in case you for anyone who knows my usual tricks <laughs> uh, in the audience who thinks that I've gone astray, just a couple of slides to explain to you how I came to crystals, which is this picture on the right. Um, and that's via alcove walks. This is the same exact crystal as the one on the left. So these two crystals are exactly the same. They have the same vertices, the same edges. Uh, and the same labels on all of the edges, but one is packaged um, in term geometrically in terms of the model of alcove walks. This is a little bit different than the the model of Littleman from the earlier slide, um, but sort of more similar in spirit. And for me, the reason that I started to love crystals a lot is because I learned, uh, and this is a picture from a project from like 10 years ago, that they give me a way to, to construct an entire family of combinatorial objects starting just from one top element. Okay, so if this is a picture of a construction uh, that I needed and somehow this gray, um, this gray walk that goes all the way up, quote unquote, to the top, um, is the top most uh, element. And then I'm applying a bunch of crystal operators to get um, initially to this one and then eventually to everywhere everywhere else here in this picture. So they give a nice, um, yeah, they give a nice construction for, you get a, you get a lot for one. <laughs> Maybe that's the moral somehow. And um, yeah, okay. Okay, so maybe that intro was less comfortable for this audience, but, um, oh, actually, sorry. No, I have to tell you about Demizor crystals and then we'll get into, uh, sorry, then we'll get into the other piece. Okay, so Demizor crystals. Okay, then we'll take a break. That'll be perfect actually. So Demizor crystals um, now are actually what's gonna appear in Schubert polynomials. So in the pipe dreams um, that I'll tell you about in the second half. And the spirit of Demizor crystals um, for the purpose of this talk, I want you to understand them as truncations of the entire crystal um, where we're restricting the operators that we're allowed to apply in a, in a prescribed way. So um, here's the 
here's one key definition to construct in this way to construct a demosur crystal. So if I have any subset of vertices in my crystal, given a fixed I, I can define a set of a bunch of other vertices in my crystal, which come about by taking something from X and lowering, whoops, sorry, and lowering it um, some number of times. Okay, so for example, if the green set that I circled over here is X, so the green set would just be the top vertex and this one additional vertex circled in green. And then I took I equals two. I would look at all the other vertices that I can get by applying um, F2 as many times as I want. So this K can be any positive, non-negative, non-negative integer. So, um, and I just see where I get from there. So including that K equals zero works. So I would, I would still have this, these two original uh, vertices in X, but I could also now apply this two and get to here, or I could apply this two and get to here. And then I could further apply, or I could further apply like two twice, F2 twice and get to there. So I have a subset of the vertices, um, which are all reachable by applying powers of F2 in this example. Okay. Um, and now you um, could define um, a similar sort of uh, sequence of operations where you start with any permutation pi in SN, you write it as um, a product of simple transpositions in a reduced way. And then the Demazur crystal associated to that same top element lambda, or that think partition lambda, and this new data pi of permutation is given by just starting with the highest weight element and then applying in sequence all of these uh, Demazur operators. So let's just compare. Um, let's look at an example and see which, which Demazur crystal we actually built and how it's indexed um, in the previous and the previous example when we were just getting used to these curly Ds and, and what they were. So in this example, UI, the highest element is this top uh, semi-standard Yum tableau with the highest weight vector. Um, and then if I apply D1, curly D1, that's when I get this collection, which was my green circled bunch before. And then after that, I applied all possible um, operators to, to whatever I had before. And I have created the Demazur crystal associated to this permutation S2S1 um, with the same partition shape two comma one. Um, they're also, uh, characters. So characters, uh, they also provide, Demazur crystals also provide or yield characters. So the character of the Demazur crystal indexed now by two parameters. So a pi and a lambda is the key polynomial, um, indexed by the composition, which would take that, um, that, that partition lambda and then put it out of order by, um, the permutation pi. Okay. So here's the key polynomial corresponding to this Demazur crystal that we just built. Um, and I've just recorded for the heck of it, the composition. Um, I took a partition two one zero, and now I've made it out of order and I get the composition one zero two. And, um, I just record the monomials that I get along the way. And there are five of them because there are five vertices there and they all happen to be distinct in this example. Okay, not, yeah, doesn't have to be the case. Okay, um, and so just as a remark to sort of tie the two, the big full crystal picture together to the um, Demazur crystal, the sure polynomial is actually the character of a Demazur crystal as well. It's just when you take pi to be the longest element, w0, um, which doesn't provide any restrictions on your um, your operators uh, in, a, in a way that will, yeah, 
it doesn't provide any restrictions that will affect your, your overall vertex set that you obtain. And so, yeah, you can get the, the shear polynomials as a special case of this construction as well, where you sort of take the biggest possible permutation. Okay, so maybe now this is actually a perfect time uh, to take a break from the crystal theory and then we'll do more Schubert stuff after the break. Sounds good, thank you very much. So it's uh, 4.56, let's take five minutes break. So I'll see you at 5.01.